Hello friends, I am Dr. K.D. Mishra and I will discuss with you some of the topics in human physiology. The first topic which we will discuss is homeostasis. Now before discussing homeostasis, let us revise some of the basics of physiology and the structural organization of organisms. The word physiology is a Greek word, physis means nature and logos means a study, that is a study of biological functions of an organism how the body works starting from the cellular level to tissue level and then how the organs work and then how the organs collectively work and how the organism as a whole reacts to the environmental changes. Now let us look at the functional organization of human body. You know basically the protoplasm is made up of molecules, various complex molecules forms protoplasm like protein molecules, the carbohydrates, the lipids, the nucleic acids, and further the molecules are made up of atoms. So the first level of organization of living beings is the molecular level. Then comes the cellular level. As you know, cells are the basic unit, the structural and functional units of life. All the basic functions are being performed at the level of cells. And cells with similar origin, function and structure collectively forms a particular tissue with a particular purpose, with a particular function and different types of tissues forms an organ. And organs jointly performing similar function forms organ system and an organism is a collection of organ systems working in a coordinated manner. So in all, if you see the human body or the body of any other organism, there are six levels of organization. The first level is the molecular level. Then comes the cellular level, followed by tissue level, then tissues forms higher level, the organ level, then the organs forms organ system, and the organ system collectively. The cell is the basic structural and functional unit of living. Beings. It is capable of carrying out basic processes of life. Cells of similar origin, structure, function and specialization forms a particular tissue. As you know, in our body we have got four types of tissues which includes epithelial tissue, the connective tissue, which includes uh, the fluid connective tissue like blood, the skeletal system, and uh, the loose connective tissue. Then uh, the muscular tissue and nervous tissue. All organs are made up of different types of tissues. An organ system is a collection of related organs. 
the body systems collectively forms a functional body of an organism. Now let us see the basic cell functions. The cell functions to obtain nutrients which is required for different activities of the living organism. It needs oxygen. Then it controls exchange of material between cells and surrounding environment. Different chemical reactions are performed at the level of cells, especially the metabolic processes which are required for providing energy for the working of cells. In cells, different biomolecules are synthesized like enzymes, hormones, and different cellular components are also formed inside the cell. The cells are involved in eliminating waste products from the body like carbon dioxide, urea and uric acid. These are to be eliminated, otherwise they are harmful for the normal life. Then cells have a special capability of sensing the changes that are occurring in the surrounding environment. Now again, this character of animal cells is a special and has played a significant role in the success of animals on this planet. Finally, all the cells have the capability of reproduction by cell division. But some of the cells, like nerve cells, the muscle cells, the RBCs, once they are differentiated and became specialized, they do not divide. Now coming on to the main topic, which we will discuss today, is the homeostasis. Homeo means same and stasis means to stand or to stay. That is, maintenance of a relatively stable environment in the body or it is the body's coordinated response to maintain internal stability. As you know, various biochemical processes are going on in our body at cellular level, at tissue level and for all those a constant internal environment is needed for optimal function of our body. The term homeostasis was coined by W. B. Kahn. One should not think that homeostasis means that the internal environment of the body should remain unchanged. For continuation of life, for success of life, there has to be change in our body functions in accordance to the changes in the environment, both external environment and internal environment. But then for optimal functioning of the body, all those parameters should be kept in control for the optimal functioning. Homeostasis, the body cells are contained in a watery internal environment. As you know, the water 
forms the major component of cytoplasm. It is the major component of body tissue. So all the exchanges, all the chemical reactions are taking place through this medium. It is through this fluid medium life sustaining exchanges are made between external environment, between body systems, up to tissues and cellular level. The fluid media within the body is categorized into two categories. One is extracellular and the intracellular fluids. The intracellular fluid means the fluid which is contained inside the cells, mainly we call it cytoplasm, and the extracellular fluid that is ECF, sometimes we call it intercellular fluid also, that is the fluid outside the cells but present between cells of the tissue or between organs. Now, this makes the internal environment, this extracellular fluid, makes the internal environment in the body. Further, we can classify this extracellular fluid into three categories. The first one is plasma. Plasma is the fluid component of blood. If we exclude formed elements like uh, RBC, WBCs and platelets, the remaining fluid part is called plasma. Then comes the interstitial fluid. Uh, when the blood flows through the capillaries, it is filtered and the liquid which comes out of capillaries forms the interstitial fluid which is filled around the cells and tissues. Now this fluid, this interstitial fluid, which is formed as a result of filtration of blood has to be returned back into the blood stream. So it is collected by a system called lymphatic system. The fluid is collected into minute capillaries called lymph capillaries and through lymph vessels it is again returned back to the blood stream and again flows back into the main Now, let us see what are the factors which are mainly regulated by homeostasis. Although almost all the living processes are regulated by homeostasis, but here we'll discuss some of the important factors the first one and the very much important is the temperature. The regulation of temperature is called thermoregulation. As you know, we the human beings are homeotherms and we maintain our body temperature constant. At a point where all the life activities, all the enzymatic activities are performed at optimum level. So temperature has to be maintained. Then the concentration of water, the concentration of salts and other electrolytes are to be regulated. This phenomena is called osmoregulation and kidney plays a very important role in it. Next comes pH. Again, it is a very important factor for 
different enzymatic chemical reactions. As you know, all the enzymes have a nature to work as a particular pH level. So pH level in the body fluids has to be maintained and the optimum pH level for living organisms is around 7.4. Then concentration of respiratory gases like carbon dioxide and oxygen has to be maintained. If the amount of carbon dioxide increases, then the respiratory process begins to eliminate carbon dioxide from the body. Then concentration of nutrient, especially glucose. As you know, glucose is the main fuel for functioning of the living organisms. So a proper level of glucose is to be maintained. As you know in human body, if the amount of glucose increases, it causes an element called diabetes. So it has to be maintained at optimum level. Then concentrated products should be monitored. Like urea, if it increases, it causes harm to the body. Then volume and pressure of fluids maintained. Now let us see the contribution of different organ systems in homeostasis. Although nearly all the organ systems plays their role in maintaining homeostasis. Here we will discuss some of the important organ systems actively involved in the process of homeostasis. First of all, the circulatory system. The circulatory system is involved in transport of material from one part of the body to another, from blood to the cells, from cells to the blood. It is important in supply of nutrients, in supply of oxygen, and it is important for collection of carbon dioxide and various metabolites which are produced at cellular level. Then the digestive system, as you know, for continuation of life, we need energy and energy comes from the food material. The digestive system is involved in ingestion, digestion, assimilation of food. It is important for transfer of water and electrolytes which we take in. That is from external environment to internal environment. Then for elimination of undigested food. Then respiratory system. It is involved in the exchange of respiratory gases from the external environment. That is taking in oxygen and elimination of carbon dioxide. Another very important contribution of the respiratory system is the maintenance of proper pH in the body. You know when carbon dioxide is transported back from tissues to lungs, in this process carbonic acid is formed. This carbonic acid lowers the pH value of blood and it may cause harm so therefore this carbon dioxide should be eliminated and pH should be raised at the optimum level of 7.4 so the respiratory system plays an important role in maintenance of pH then the urinary system 
It is very important for the elimination of nitrogenous waste. You know, nitrogenous waste are produced as a result of catabolism of proteins in the body. And the products like urea, uric acid are harmful to our body and therefore they are to be eliminated. Another very important function performed by the excretory system, especially kidney, is the osmoregulation, that is maintenance of water level in the body and maintenance of electrolytes. As you know, in different seasons, we require different quantity of water. So, the quantity of water should be regulated in the body. And this function is being done. Then, we know that all the systems of living beings, all the organs, and body as a whole is being controlled by a system. We call it neuroendocrine system. The first component that is nervous system involves central nervous system that is brain and spinal cord and peripheral nerves. So it is very important for detecting changes that is occurring in external environment and then it is important and plays a key role in control and coordination of bodily activities in accordance with the changes that are occurring in the environment. So it is very much essential for success of life. Then comes another controlling system, that is endocrine system. The endocrine gland secretes hormones. These are chemical regulators which regulate almost all the activities, almost all the biochemical activities, almost all the functions of living beings. It controls nutrient concentration the concentration of glucose, the main fuel which we are using. When the amount of glucose increases in our body, the hormone insulin is secreted from pancreas and it converts the glucose into glycogen. And when the glucose is needed, the glycogen is again broken by another hormone called glucagon to compensate the amount of glucose in the body. It also controls the osmolegulatory process in the kidney, uh, the amount of water in the body is being controlled by a hormone called ADH. Then all the activities of gastrointestinal tract are also controlled by various hormones and of course the reproductive functions are stimulated, controlled by the hormones secreted by different endocrine. Then comes the integumentary system, the system of skin and its derivatives, various glands present in the skin. First of all, the skin serves as a barrier between the external and internal environment. It is very important for protecting ourselves from the invasion of various pathogens from heat, from cold, so on and so forth. Then it plays a very important role in 
temperature regulation for maintaining constant temperature. When there is too much heat outside, we start sweating and by evaporation of sweat, there is evaporative cooling and our body gets cooled. A very important function of skin is that it has millions of sense organs. Sense organs for touch, sense organs for, I mean, uh, chemical signals, sense organs for pressure, sense organs for sound, sense organs for light and so on. And sensing external stimuli, especially change in external environment, is very important to protect life from the odds of external environment. Then comes the immune system, our defense system, which provides us defense against foreign pathogens. It helps in repairing and replacing of injured and worn. Then comes skeletal system. Skeletal system protects our soft tissue, our organs. It is involved in the movement of uh, organs and movement of human being. Uh, it plays a very important role in maintenance of level of calcium in our body. In fact, it serves as a storage reservoir for calcium. Another very important feature is the homeopoiesis, that is formation of blood. As you know, in our blood, the formed elements include RBC and WBC, and these cells have a particular lifetime. Say, for example, our RBC the lifetime is four months, that is 120 days. After that, they are destroyed and continuously new RBCs are formed. So this process of homeopoiesis, or we may call it erythropoiesis, is performed at the level of red bone marrow. Then comes the muscular system. Now, for normal functioning of all the organs, there is a function of muscles. There are smooth muscles inside the uh, wall of elementary canal. There are cardiac muscles in the heart. So, for uh, functioning of different parts of the body, for locomotion, muscular system. Now, we are coming to the homeostatic control systems. In order to maintain homeostasis, the control system must be able to, first of all, detect the changes in internal environment, then integrate this information in the central nervous system for making appropriate adjustment for restoring the optimal value of that factor. Now, control systems are grouped into two categories. One is the intrinsic controls, that it controls at the local level. It is a inherent compensatory response of an organ to a change. That means every cell has got a inherent capacity and nature to respond to a change. But that is not so important 
for maintaining homeostasis. The most important one is the extrinsic control. That is response of an organ that are triggered by the factors external to the organ. So when there is a change around the organ, when there is a change around the organism, a response is triggered in the nervous system and endocrine system that is helpful to bring back the normal. Now both intrinsic and extrinsic control systems basically operates in on two principles. One is the feed forward and another is feedback. The feed forward response are made on the basis of anticipation of a change. And this comes from the experience. So when you are supposed to be exposed to a certain condition, by way of your previous experience, you know that you are going to be exposed to such a magnitude of a, such a factor, such a change in the factor. So your body prepares to fight for that change. So that we call feed forward. But then the most important for the homeostatic control is the feedback mechanism. It refers to the responses made after the change has been detected. Actually, when the change occurs, it is being detected by our system and our system accordingly functions to bring back the normalcy. There are two types of feedback systems, the negative feedback system and positive feedback system. We'll discuss these in detail. The negative feedback system, if there is a change in a factor, it triggers a response that seeks to restore the normal condition. It is a pathway where the response opposes the signal. It is a primary type of homeostatic control. Initially, it is based on the principle that it is a response which opposes the change that has occurred. The components of the negative feedback mechanism are three. The first one is sensor, that is the sense organ which senses the change in a parameter. It senses, it monitors the magnitude of a variable, sends the message to a control center, which is mainly situated in the central nervous system, especially brain. Then the magnitude of that change is being analyzed in the brain and then a message is sent to a affected organ which makes a response to produce a desired effect to bring back the normal condition. Now we'll try to understand the feedback mechanism through the example of thermoregulation. First of all, we must know that the thermostate of our body, that is the part of the brain which controls 
which monitors any changes temperature is the hypothalamus. So we call it thermostate of our body. When there is a fall in body temperature, then the temperature is being sensed by the nerve cells and sensory organs. The message is sent to the temperature control center that is thermostate in the hypothalamus. And then a message is sent to the effector organs like skeletal muscles, like liver, to generate heat. When the heat is produced, you know, uh, normally uh, the heat is produced by the uh, muscles of body organs by improving the metabolic conditions. But then if there is a severe cold, then there is, is a contraction in the skeletal muscles. Uh, and due to shivering, heat is produced. And this heat through the blood, again, um, this temperature of the blood is increases and this negative feedback is sent again to the controlling center of brain, that is hypothalamus, where this action of heat production Now another example of negative feedback is the control of respiration. As we have discussed earlier, uh, due to increase in metabolism at cellular level, uh, there is an increase in carbon dioxide concentration. In the interstitial fluid, then uh, this triggers this fluid when it is circulated through blood into the controlling center, respiratory center, which is situated in medulla oblongata of hind brain. So when the amount of carbon dioxide increases, the respiratory center initiates inspiratory process, it stimulates inspiratory center an inspiratory center sends a message to effector organs like intercostal muscles and phrenic muscles to begin the process of inspiration. And as soon as the inspiration starts, the amount of carbon dioxide is eliminated. And again, when the amount of carbon dioxide decreases in blood, the negative feedback response, the negative feedback signal is sent to the respiratory center of medulla oblongata and medulla oblongata stops the inspiratory process and automatically expiration starts. Another feedback mechanism, negative feedback mechanism, is the control of blood pressure. When there is an increase in blood pressure, atrial blood pressure, the sense organs present on the blood capillaries, they sense it and send the message to the control center in medulla oblongata, we call it vasomotor center. That means a center which regulates the dilation and constriction of blood vessels. When the blood vessels are dilated, the blood pressure is lowered. When the blood vessels are constricted, the blood pressure is increases. Now, when this message of increase in blood pressure is sent to this 
vasomotor center of mediola. It sends a message to heart and blood vessels to decrease pumping activity of heart and dilation of blood vessels, we call it vasodilation. By both these acts, the blood pressure is decreased and this is again sensed by the baroreceptors and the message is again sent to the medulla oblongata and the action of increasing the pumping activity of heart and vasodilation is stopped. Now we are coming to another type of feedback system which is positive feedback system. It amplifies an initial change. It do not occur as often as negative feedback mechanism. To understand this better, let us take example. When in the uterus, the fetus is full term. The uterine contraction starts to begin the process of parturition. Now this is done by a hormone called oxytocin. So it is only released when the embryo becomes full term, fully developed. So it is, it is a positive message to the center located in hypothalamus to release oxytocin, which increases contraction in the uterus for birth of baby. Another very interesting example of positive feedback mechanism is the secretion and release of milk from the breast when the baby sucks the nipple of mammary gland. When the baby sucks the nipple, the myoepithelial cells of the nipples and the sensory cells over there sends a message to hypothalamus in the brain and from hypothalamus a signal is sent, a chemical signal is sent to pituitary gland. Now two hormones are released from there. One hormone is called prolactin. Prolactin is a hormone which increases the secretion of milk from the lactiferous glands of breast. Another hormone which is very important for release of milk from the gland. That is oxytocin. When it is secreted, the myoepithelial cells of the nipple get relaxed and the milk is released. So this is a positive feedback mechanism. There is a stimulus by sucking of nipple and this causes the response from the controlling center situated in the hypothalamus that through pituitary it secretes two hormones which are involved in secretion and releasing of milk from the breast only when there is an input of 
sucking the nipple. Now, once again, we see this positive feedback mechanism through this flow chart. When there is an onset of labor, the oxytocin is released from the hypothalamus. It increases uterine contractions. The head of the baby is pushed through the cervix. The hormone oxytocin helps in stretching of cervix. More oxytocin is released. More uterine contraction occurs. And that is how the birth of a baby. Another example of feedback mechanism that is positive feedback mechanism is the secretion of gastric juice from the gastric glands of the stomach. When food enters in the stomach, the pyloric stomach secretes a GI hormone. Called gastric. This hormone initiates the secretion of gastric juice from the gastric glands. Proenzyme pepsinogen is secreted from the peptic cells and hydrochloric acid is secreted from the oxyntic cells. When these two interacts in the lumen of stomach, active enzyme pepsin is produced which digests proteins present in the food material. As soon as the food is removed from the stomach, the secretion of SCL stops. So this is a positive feedback mechanism of secretion of gastric juice from the stomach. Another example of positive feedback system is blood clotting. Whenever there is a rupture of blood vessels and the blood flows out, there is a cascade of clotting factors which works for formation of clot. So clotting factors are activated in the clot itself. And these clotting, initial clotting factors activates other clotting factors. As you know, there are 13 clotting factors which are activated and clot is formed and the bleeding is. Now let us compare the negative and positive feedback mechanisms. When we see the negative feedback mechanism, which, which plays a main role in homeostasis, there is an initial stimulus which provokes a response and response produces a change in the parameter and that change in the parameter which is required for sustaining the normal values sends a negative message to the controlling center and the process is stopped. In contrast, in positive feedback mechanism, there is an initial stimulus which provokes a response and response causes the change which is needed when this outside stimulus stops, then this positive feedback 
also stops otherwise it will continue so the positive feedback is not very important and sometimes it is uh, I mean, harmful to our body another comparison of positive and negative feedback systems as we see in negative feedback system if there is a hemorrhage the blood pressure lowers that means uh, the uh, body will increase reabsorption uh, the body will increase reabsorption of fluid in the kidney then uh, the center at hypothalamus will cause vasoconstrictor contraction the chemicals like catecholamines and vasopressin will increase the blood pressure and as soon as the blood pressure is increased to the normal value this response stops so that is a negative feedback system comparing it with positive when there is a hemorrhage the blood pressure goes down the cardiac output increases ventricular function increases to increase the blood pressure there is a increase in coronary blood flow there is increase in lactic acid and hydrogen ion concentration which increases the blood flow in coronary circulation so this is how the positive feedback system works now there is a feed forward mechanism it brings about a compensatory response in anticipation of a change in a regulated variable feed forward control is exemplified by normal anticipation and regulation of heart beat in advance of actual physical exertion by the central autonomic network as you know if one is prepared to go for a marathon or one is prepared for uh, i mean some athletic activity then he knows that he is uh, going to have a physical exercise so his body is prepared for that now there is a difference between feed forward and feed back mechanism uh, we take an example of thermoregulation in feed forward mechanism there is a fall in environmental temperature heat receptors of the skin uh, receives this stimulus message is sent to the thermoregulatory center in the brain muscles and blood vessels then muscles contracts heat is produced and it is bring it is brought back to the normal condition feed forward regulation anticipates and improve the speed of body's homeostatic response in contrast feedback mechanism if there is a fall in body temperature uh, this will cause fall in blood temperature message is sent to the hypothalamus then hypothalamus sends message to blood vessels and muscles for heat production heat is produced when it be, uh, when it is brought to the normal level the response stops so in conclusion a homeostatic control system main relies on feedback mechanism that too especially negative that's all for today thanks